places appear graced with more beauty or shrouded in more mystery. They rise as cradles of ocean life as their own existence has fallen in danger. Coral reefs are underwater wonderlands, bustling with crowded thoroughfares and riddled with dangerous alleyways. Inhabitants range from the familiar to the frightening to the fantastic. These most colorful of communities remain key to our understanding of life beneath the sea. They possess their own rhythms, their own rules, and their own unique rituals. What could be learned by observing a typical day there, watching the natural patterns of life evolve? Four people from 13 nations join together to find out. Men and women, young and old, they come from a variety of cultures and a wide range of professional backgrounds. Some have experience as observers, others have never done anything like this before. What they share is a love for the sea and a desire to be a part of this historic mission, the first 24-hour dive in a coral reef. From literally thousands of applicants, participants were hand-picked for their experience, expertise and personality. In the same way, the reef they would observe received careful consideration for its outstanding qualities. The Republic of Maldives, located in the Indian Ocean, consists of over a thousand coral islands resting on 26 coral atolls. About 200 of the islands are inhabited. Most are so small that it takes less than half an hour to cross them on foot. None rise more than two meters above sea level. Although the islands invoke visions of tropical paradise, what draws thousands of visitors here each year are the sights seen only from below the surrounding waves. The Tourist Bureau virtually guarantees interactions with sharks octopus and eels at any of the Maldives' 14 marine reserves. One of the reserves, called Mayatilla, hosts some 200 divers each day. Unfortunately, the heavy human traffic isn't wearing well on the reef. Much of its surface appears badly scarred. Most of the hard coral on top of the reef is destroyed. In addition, the El Niño of 1998 warmed some tropical waters to temperatures high enough to kill coral, destroying reefs around the world. The Maldives marine reserves suffered damage as well. Still, Mayatilla emerged as the resounding choice for the 24-hour observation. At about 80 meters in diameter, it can be circled in a single dive. Its variable terrain includes a flat top with caves, overhangs and ledges along the entire reef wall. But most importantly, the abundance of sea life is extraordinary. Wherever you look, Mayatilla pulses with life. 
It's precisely the type of bustling environment the project requires. The objectives are simple, to document with video and still photographs the natural processes of life in the reef over an uninterrupted 24-hour period. An idea this ambitious requires great technical planning. One early concern centered on the long underwater shifts that might cause divers to suffer from hypothermia and decompression sickness or the bends. The choice of breathing apparatus and the proper gas to fill it with became crucial. After much discussion and research, the team uses air tanks called rebreathers Instead of releasing all of the gas consumed after each breath, rebreathers recycle some of the gas through the tank for use again. This process gives divers more air to stay down longer. It also produces less noise and fewer bubbles, allowing divers to get closer to their subjects without scaring them away. Additionally, the warm, moist, rebreathed air helps prevent dehydration and hypothermia. Excessive amounts of nitrogen in the body creates the disabling cramps called the bends. To help prevent them, the diver's tanks are filled with a gas called safe air, a mixture with more oxygen and less nitrogen than regular air. After months of preparation, the dive is only a day away. The expedition crew is divided into five teams of videographers and photographers. Others monitor the diver's topside and work on a live internet feed. The boat buzzes with activity. All systems are go. But suddenly a problem arises that threatens everything. Hey, Sasa. Yes, Richard. Where's the magic panel? FedEx positive, Richard. I just checked. A vital piece of equipment used in the rebreathers was mistakenly shipped elsewhere. In the remaining hours before the dive's scheduled start, a frantic race against time is waged in search of a solution. Then, without warning, Mother Nature presents a mission-ending threat of her own. The heavens open, rolling the ocean, and bombarding the boat with thunder, lightning, and driving rain. Could it be the monsoons have begun early? As the storm rages, replacement parts for the missing equipment are quickly cobbled together. But if the rainy season is indeed ahead of schedule, all the hard work leading to this day could be for naught. Dangerous waves and diminished visibility threaten the entire mission. The long stormy night feeds fears of delay and even cancellation. But by mid-morning, the tempest is history. A great sigh of relief welcomes the picture-perfect day. Below the calm sea, Mayatila beckons. At high noon, the first team of divers inaugurates the historic 24-hour mission with a splash. Normally midday is a quiet time in coral reefs, but Mayatilla bursts with so much life that there's still plenty of activity. Grey reef sharks swim brazenly in blue daylight. The divers use caution, but there's really little danger. Reef sharks are curious, but rarely aggressive with humans. 
The teams observe the reef in regular shifts, diving for an hour and a half before returning to the boat to rest for an hour, then taking another 90-minute tour of the reef. In addition to the diving teams, an observation station is set up on a location called Sega Rock. At 30 meters, it lies at the foot of Mayatilla. A light simulates 24-hour sunlight. A video camera records the constant flow of activity. Scientists want to see if the behavior on Sega Rock still mirrors the rest of the reef. Back on top of Mayatilla, much of the damage caused by the El Niño disaster is in evidence. But there are also encouraging signs of rebirth. The dead corals have become platforms for other animals to settle in. Clusters of stinging anemones, sponges and sea squirts colonize the reef top. Each anemone is home to a family of black-footed clownfish. The anemone offers the clownfish protection. The fish rids its host of parasites and acts as bait for unwary predators that fall prey to the anemone's sting. The clownfish isn't naturally immune to the effect of the anemone's paralyzing tentacles. By rubbing its body against its host from an early age, the clownfish vaccinates itself against potential harm. Clownfish society follows a rigid hierarchy. The matriarch or dominant female rules. All others in her domain are male. Should misfortune befall the queen, the highest ranking male becomes the new leader and miraculously changes into a female. Clownfish aren't the only reef residents prone to magical transformations. In an instant, a rock becomes an octopus as the master of underwater disguise beats a hasty retreat. He'll spend the rest of the afternoon sleeping, rising again after sundown to prowl for food. Other nocturnal creatures like the fierce-looking moray eel and the resplendent lionfish wait undercover for darkness to descend. But other creatures use the waning afternoon to finish their chores. A fussy-looking titan triggerfish builds her nest. It's serious work, and she's all business, warning a diver in no uncertain terms she's too busy to be bothered. Further below, near the observation point at Sega Rock, an ultra-slim trumpet fish takes advantage of its unusual shape to hide among the branches of a coral tree, waiting to ambush prey. Soon, food dominates the minds of many animals here. An hour before sunset, the tempo of life drastically increases. An evening rush hour begins as daytime feeders frantically search for a final bite before turning in for the night. The hawksbill turtle scans the reef for its favorite meal of sponges. About a half dozen of these turtles have settled on Mayatilla. Sadly, hawksbills are endangered, mainly because humans have hunted them to near extinction for their meat and beautiful shells. The divers hope to observe hawksbills communicating with their bodies. Certain flipper movements, ducking their heads and exposing their underbellies are among the signals they use. The 24-hour mission may expand our knowledge of their vocabulary.
But now in twilight, the hawksbill starts to look for a comfortable place to rest among the coral outcrops. At sundown, most animals settle in to sleep or struggle to wake up. With so many predators preoccupied, some creatures like the sea cucumber use this crucial time to spawn. The male and female sea cucumber rise to spew eggs and sperm into the evening current. The relative absence of predators increases its chances of successfully producing offspring. But this small window of opportunity closes quickly. The reef's most voracious predators come out at night. Like a yogi on a bed of nails, a clownfish makes itself comfortable within the stinging fronds of an anemone. A parrotfish finds a safe spot to sleep among the coral crevices. But before turning in, it constructs a sleeping bag of saliva. Instead of comfort, the bag provides an ingenious safety alarm. If it's disturbed in any way, it creates vibrations, which wake the parrotfish in time to escape possible danger. While others doze, the white-tipped reef sharks are out, and they're hungry. The hunters of the reef, they'll eat any sea creature that ventures here, including fish and crustaceans. By seven o'clock, the top of the reef is swarming with them. By now, poison-quilled lionfish also feed on the reef top. With a mouth large enough to swallow prey nearly its own size, the lionfish prowls the reef for fish. Hermit crabs are now scrambling across the reef, seeking out the remains of the day. These coral shrimps are fierce predators. They even feed on their own kind. Predators don't have to appear ferocious to be effective. This harmless looking tube worm opens for business, a full night's work feeding on plankton. Crinoids, commonly known as feather stars, crawl to vantage points on the reef top, uncurling their feathery arms to feed on plankton borne on passing currents. They look like plants, but these creatures are cousins of sea stars and sea urchins. They have no heads, only small central bodies surrounded by five to two hundred arms. At 30 meters, a massive school of neon blue and gold fusilias patrol Sega Rock. Nearby, one of the reef's most efficient hunters lies in wait. Moroi eels look like terrifying sea snakes, but they're actually fish. The rhythmic opening and closing of their jaws displays rows of needle-sharp teeth, adding menace to an already vicious appearance. But this movement isn't just for show. It helps mores push water over their gills so they can breathe. 
Still, the eels are every bit as testy as they look. In spite of poor eyesight, they use a keen sense of smell to hunt octopus, shrimp and fish. An unfortunate fusilia becomes a moray's meal. By midnight, the transition from the day shift to the night is complete. Hawks build turtles, parrotfish and others snooze while the nocturnal creatures revel in the hunt. The 24-hour observation documents a fundamental change of daily life in the reef. After midnight, the reef assumes a more leisurely pace. The swirl of activity felt earlier in the evening has slowed. Several resident turtles rest blissfully within coral outcrops on the reef top and in overhangs on the slope. As if in a stupor, a few hawksbills relish a midnight snack before surfacing slowly to breathe. This phenomenon could be a response to the artificial light stimulus on Sega Rock. Turtles rarely forage at night. With the reef top clear of sharks, the area is dominated by bizarre looking cornet fish and the aptly named unicorn fish. Nearby, a couple of lionfish make what appears half-hearted final attempts at the hunt. Feather stars continue to feed late into the night. Suddenly, a marble ray sweeps in out of the darkness, scarring the reef slope for food. With a wingspan of about a meter and a half, it hovers momentarily before tracking down its prey in the sand. With eyes on top and a mouth underneath, it would be nearly impossible for the ray to hunt by sight. Special sensors on its underside provide an uncanny ability to detect a potential meal even one buried beneath the sandy sea floor. But here's one meal that got away. This miniature sole, only about six centimeters long, has a special hunting tool of its own. When the sole buries itself in the sand, it resembles a flatworm. Its nose works as a lure to help the fish attract a meal.
Meanwhile, the powerful light shining on Sega Rock attracts a thick concentration of plankton, mostly small shrimp. In a few hours, they'll serve as an incredible breakfast buffet for several species of reef dwellers. The early morning hours are prime mating time for nocturnal creatures. Courting cuttlefish share a stroll along the reef floor. Actual mating may not begin before daybreak. Four a.m. heralds the last hour of complete darkness. The reef experiences its quietest moments during the 24-hour cycle. At five, darkness begins to give way to dawn. Like a vampire, the sated feather star shuns the light and hastens a retreat to its dark daytime lair. As some creatures hurry to bed, an early rising parrotfish awakes, chewing away out of its sleeping bag. It's still quiet as many creatures begin to stir from their slumber. But in an hour, the reef will be rocking with activity. As daylight returns, the reef's pulse quickens. Diurnal residents re-enter the realm as nocturnal feeders prey on slow morning risers or late night stragglers. Many rise groggily, but it won't take long for the reef to resume its daytime guise with gusto. Rested and active again, reef sharks are back on patrol, looking for breakfast. Other predators, including barracudas, jacks and tunas, also cruise in for a bite. The clownfish shakes off the anemone's blanket of tentacles. A hawksbill turtle nibbles at his first bite of the new day. At 30 meters, it's still dark, but large numbers of blue-striped snappers create a spectacle around the spotlight, feasting on the thick soup of plankton. A school of anchovies joins the feast. Big eyes and batfish claim their places around the Sega Rock Observation Station. But food isn't foremost on every mind. An octopus ignores the commotion around him for the relative calm of its domain. A cousin of the squid, cuttlefish and nautilus, the octopus is among the most intelligent of sea creatures. It also enjoys excellent eyesight, very much like humans, able to register shape, texture and colour. Equipped with advanced sensory organs, an octopus can alter its appearance within seconds, not only as camouflage, but also to signal alarm, aggression and sexual intention.
After a night of courtship, a male engages his mate in a deep embrace. Using a specially modified tentacle, he inserts a packet of sperm into her. She soon lays up to a hundred thousand eggs, tending them rigorously for four to eight weeks. After the eggs hatch, the female dies. Males live on, but never mate again. All over the reef, animals pair off, and not only to reproduce. Symbiotic relationships, where animals team up for mutual gain, abound here. The clownfish and the anemone offer one example. Another is the cleaner wrasse and unicorn fish. While the larger fish gets a good grooming, the smaller wrasse enjoys an easy meal. Neon fusilias need cleaning too, but this time the job has the rest looking down in the mouth. Without doubt, the most vital symbiotic relationship in a coral reef is one between a tiny plant, an algae, known as Zuzantale, and the coral themselves. Corals are polyps, small headless animals surrounded by tentacles. Their colonies build the hard coral skeletons that form the coral reefs. Since coral populate warm, shallow waters, they provide the perfect outposts for the Zuzantale to live on close enough to the water's surface to receive sunlight for photosynthesis. In return, the algae make food for the coral. The algae also give coral reefs their distinct bright colors. But pollutants and water temperatures over 30 degrees Celsius can kill the algae. The coral turns white, or becomes bleached and dies. In 1998, warm ocean temperatures destroyed about 60% of the world's inner reefs. Fortunately, many are making strong comebacks. It's hard to imagine in the hustle and bustle of the reef's morning rush hour that all of this was nearly lost forever. By mid-morning, the pace has decreased, but the fish continue to feed steadily. As noon rolls around, the reef looks much as it did 24 hours ago. Though it went through many changes in mood and appearance during the time, the rhythms of the reef remain steady and consistent, reflecting an orderly cycle of life. At noon, the last of the film crew surfaces. The world's first round-the-clock observation of life on a coral reef is complete. But um, we had all these margins building in there with one very small package, just the fill panel not arriving. Put an enormous strain on, on the whole shoot. 
but it but it was it was great. I mean, we had a lot of people's great qualities showing showing through. We had, I mean, Raymond, for example, was very helpful with a gas system because he's very familiar with that membrane system. The shoot itself proves an astonishing success. The only mishaps included two photographers forced to abort due to flu and fever, and another who suffered a nasty encounter with a moray. Throughout, support from the crew, technicians and scientific teams remained invaluable. The 24-hour dive marks the culmination of more than a year of challenges. In addition to creating a visual record, the team monitored important variables affecting reef activity, such as changes in light intensity and water temperature. The live internet broadcast gave millions new insight into the world of the coral reef and allowed them to share in the unique experience. It's, it's when you're really tired, you've been working hard, and you've done stuff before the 24 hour start. So although we took about 24 hours in reality, it's much longer than that. You know, because we start at 12 o'clock, it runs up at, by you know, seven o'clock in the morning anyway. So they've got like, five hours to tag on to the 24 hours to, to do this at all. It's a huge technical challenge anyway. Though the expedition adds much to our understanding, a mere 24-hour glimpse into the life of a single reef cannot possibly tell us all we need to know about these vital and visually stunning ecosystems. But one thing that is very clear from the experience is that these reefs must be preserved to ensure the survival of countless species, possibly even our own. Just a year after the coral bleaching tragedy, Mayatila's hard corals are again thriving. But meaningful recovery is slow and depends on successful annual spawning by surviving coral colonies. Scientists estimate that a damaged reef may take at least a decade to recover fully. Despite threats from nature and human intrusion, Mayatila remains vibrant and magnificent, a reef with a density and diversity of life far richer than most on the planet. It stands as an exquisite monument to the resiliency and splendor of the natural world. <laughs>